As for the argument that on the analogy of an image being Vishnu, this is only a meditation with the help of an image, which in this case is I, that is improper, since that would amount to a figurative interpretation of the texts about unity. It is also improper because the syntactical forms of the passages are different. Where the intention is that a symbol should have an idea superimposed upon it, the sentence occurs only unilaterally, as, for instance, the mind is Brahman, Chandogya 3, 18, 1. The sun is Brahman, Chandogya 3, 19, 1. But here the Upanishad says, I am thee, and thou art me. Hence, identity is to be understood from this kind of text that are dissimilar to those dealing with symbols. Moreover, the dualistic conception is condemned, as in, while he who worships another god, thinking, he is one, and I am another, does not know. Brihadaranyaka 1.4.10 He goes from death to death who sees difference, as it were, in it. Brihadaranyaka 4.4.19 All ousts one who knows it as different from the self. Brihadaranyaka 4.5.7 And there are many other Upanishadic texts of this kind, which denounced the dualistic conceptions. It was argued that the two things of opposite characteristics cannot be identical with each other. That is nothing damaging, as the reasonable position is that the opposition in characteristics is unreal. And it is a false argument that God will cease to be so because one has to accept scriptural authority and because such a position is not held by us. For we do not admit that the scriptures speak of God himself as the transmigrating soul. What do you admit, then? We hold that the scriptures aim at establishing the identity of the transmigrating soul with God himself by removing from the soul all vestiges of transmigration. From this point of view, it becomes affirmed that God is possessed of the characteristics of being untouched by sins, etc., and that the opposite characteristics of the soul are unreal. The criticism is also unfounded that no one will be left over to practice the Vedantic path and that direct perception, etc., will be outraged. For the transmigratory state is conceded before enlightenment, and the activities like perception are confined within that state only, because texts as this. But when to the knower of Brahman everything has become the self, then what should one see, and through what? Brihadaranyaka 2.4.14 Point out the absence of perception, etc., in the state of enlightenment. Opponent In the absence of perception, etc., the Vedas also will cease to exist. Vedantin, that is no defect, since that position is admitted by us. For according to the text starting with, in this state the father is no father, and ending with, the Vedas are no Vedas, Brihadaranyaka 4.3.22, we do admit the absence of the Vedas themselves in the state of enlightenment. Opponent, who is it, then, that has this unenlightenment? Vedanta. We say that it is you yourself who ask thus. Opponent. Is it not stated by the Upanishad that I am God? Vedanta. If that is so, you are already an enlightened man, and so nobody has unenlightenment. Hereby is also refuted the criticism of some people who say that the self becomes associated with a second entity owing to the very presence of nescience, so that non-dualism becomes untenable. Hence, one should fix one's mind on the self, which is God. Namaste. Well, this is a great purport. 
I really love the points that he brings up. First, he quotes my favorite line from Yajnavalkya, when to the knower of Brahman, everything has become the self, then what is there to see and through what? And so on. In other words, there is no perception in the state of full enlightenment, identity with Brahman. Why? Because there is no other to be the object of perception. Brahman is certainly conscious, but conscious only of itself, which is everything. So, <laughs> Brahman knows everything by default because it knows itself. But then he goes on to quote further from Brihadaranyakapanishad that a father is no father. The Vedas are no Vedas in that state. Let's take a look at the context of that shloka. Verse 21. That is his form, beyond desires, free from evils, and fearless. As a man, fully embraced by his beloved wife, does not know anything at all, either external or internal, so does this infinite being, self, fully embraced by the supreme self, not know anything at all, either external or internal. That is his form, in which all objects of desire have been attained, and are but the self, and which is free from desires and devoid of grief. Text 22. In this state a father is no father, a mother, no mother, the worlds, no worlds, the gods, no gods, the Vedas, no Vedas. In this state, a thief is no thief, the killer of a noble Brahmana, no killer, a Chandala, no Chandala, a Pukulkasa, no Pukasa, a monk, no monk, a hermit, no hermit. This form of his is untouched by good work and untouched by evil work for he is then beyond all the woes of his heart, intellect. So this is the state of identity with Brahman. One is no longer affected by the external or internal qualities of being a human being, being a person, being a separate entity, an individual. So there's no karma either. There's no good nor evil, no action at all. So how can there be a reaction? See, and this is the state that one attains by this sadhana. Now, I got a comment, a nasty comment from a racist, probably Indian guy. But why is it always a guy, you know? Anyway. Uh, comment that blamed me for being in a Western body <laughs> as if I had anything to do with it, right? And accused me of playing guru. Well, I don't know how many times I have told I am not a guru. I don't claim to be a guru. I don't even claim to be a teacher. But I'm a friend. And I'm advising my friends, hey, go study the Vedas, especially the Upanishads. They have all the secrets. They have all the knowledge. Everything you need to become fully enlightened and self-realized. That's it. Bye. Have a good life, you know. I don't want to make you a disciple. I don't want to make you a follower. I don't want to make you anything except what you already are. And that is the self, Brahman. So when one realizes this state of Brahman, then there's no more idea of race, of body, of, you know, nationality, anything like that. The very first thing my Adi Guru taught his disciples is you are not this body. You are the soul within, the spirit, the consciousness. 
And that consciousness should be focused on God, not on criticizing others because of their bodily features or the place of their birth or anything. That None of that has any meaning in Brahman. He also used to tell us, if you think that you're a man or a woman, you're in illusion. <laughs> you're in Maya. Huh? What to speak of thinking, I am an Indian or I'm an American or I'm a this or a that. That's all Maya. So, okay, the people who are caught up in Maya are going to be discriminating and are going to try to get rid of others who they see as competitors. I mean, the Indians are really scared of Westerners. You know, after all, a handful of British troops subjugated India and kept it under control for nearly 200 years. And the way they did it was very clever, through economics. By parlaying the Indians' own greed against themselves. So they took over the country. The British East India Company. Huh? It wasn't a government agency. Well, it was for all practical purposes. <laughs> but it did so under the auspices of corporatism. Nothing has changed. Huh? When India became a separate country, left the British Empire in 1947, they simply kicked out the foreigners and put Indians in the same positions in the government. They didn't change anything. It's still the same parliamentary, uh, whatever, you know, form of government, <laughs> except there's no king or queen. Anyway, this is not what we're here to discuss. We're here to discuss getting beyond all these differences. Huh? That a man is not a man, a brahmana is not a brahmana, a thief is not a thief, a mlecha is not a mlecha. <laughs> In that state, you know, if there was something so terrible about Westerners, why did Ramana Maharshi agree to uh, accept them as guests and students and even disciples. So this racist interpretation of the Vedas is, you know, this is for very, very neophyte people. This is for people in the bodily conception. So we don't have that conception. We haven't had it for many, many years. I've been a vegetarian now for over 70 years. So... Yeah, I've been chanting mantra for over 60 years. So all these things have their effects. And basically every seven years, the whole body, all the cells in the body, except for some nerve cells, are completely renewed. So in fact, this body is no longer a Western Malecha body. But <laughs> this body was built on prasadam from uh, offerings in the temple uh, where I lived for many, many years, and then continued on my own after I became independent. So this is the meaning, you see, that we should not judge anyone by external features, but rather we should see them as Brahman, merely covered over by some externals. And if we see like that, there are no unenlightened people. There are no evil people, no bad people. There are only different degrees of covering. That's all. And so the Vedas prescribe many, many different methods that are appropriate to the different stages of covering. That's all. So it may be convenient at a certain very neophyte stage to believe that there are different races and different colors and this, all this external stuff. But that's only to encourage the people to actually practice their own religion. If they do, if they actually practice it and don't just sit around blaming others, you know, for their own lack of spiritual success, 
they might actually realize something and get beyond all these external ideas and prejudices and so on. That's the purpose of this teaching. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.